Dear friend, thank you for writing to me. I must admit that I am impressed with your resourcefulness to track me back here all the way from the waters of the inner sea. You must tell me how you determined I had left Absalom so quickly. The city at the centre of the world is an easy place to disappear, and I had thought I had covered my tracks well enough. Perhaps it was some external intervention, what others may call luck, that helped your raven find its mark. If so, then we must thank the one responsible, for the story relayed in your letter concerns me greatly. It has been many years since I last visited Laverton. The Missa Shelf dunes are among the prettiest in all Andoran, and the charming Wattle and Daub homes complement their aesthetic beautifully. There was a calm, a serenity to the village that is rarely enjoyed along the coast. It was as though the waves themselves did not want to disturb the villagers' tranquillity. Above all else, I remember well meeting Mr. Waltree Quentz for the first time in the sign of the Blue Sail to try his famous fish soup. An unforgettable experience, I am sure you will agree. His shop put Laverton on the map, no doubt about it. Nevertheless, I also remember his tendency to ascribe every odd happenstance to his beloved fish king. A hole in the netting? The work of the fish king. No holes in the netting? A blessing from the fish king. At the time, I thought this was some extended joke or local paragon, but I draw your attention to it under these new circumstances because they compel me to assume that Mr. Quence's tales have become legitimate delusions. False beliefs, held sincerely, can be dangerous even under the best of circumstances. I am sure your own investigations into Laverton's recent troubles have revealed plenty. Gossip travels faster in smaller towns, and fastest in villages. Rumour and hearsay are never far behind. But when this trio is allowed to mingle for too long, it can evolve into outright faith. Now, faith in the gods is one thing, but faith in idols with no established history, with no law, you might say, is quite another. Indeed, I would say it is hazardous. The current situation in Laverton, as you have described so intimately in your letter, strikes me as a keen example. You say the first body was discovered along the shoreline. A local fisherman, young and healthy. No obvious wounds, but the body was also relatively dry and close to the high tide line. I concur with your assessment. He almost certainly didn't drown. Indeed, his boat was still moored. The doctors in any medical institute will tell you that sudden deaths do occur in even the ablest of us, but I personally find this more of an excuse than an explanation. There are plenty of poisons and toxins in the world that leave virtually no trace on the victim, and plenty more whose traces would have been weathered away very quickly through the body's exposure to the coastal elements. I am not an expert by any means, but you might try your contacts in the Guild of Wonders if you believe foul play may be involved. Though such an alchemical explanation might satisfy the doctors, but I doubt it would satisfy the detective in you. It seems a strange commitment to assassinate a humble fisherman who spent his entire life in Laverton and caused no offence to anyone who walks on two legs. All in all, a random target. Then the second body turned up the next day, you say. Another local colour, same beach, same circumstances. And then the third, and then the fourth, one every day, like clockwork. From my cabin here on the Andersen, I admit this twist sparks a degree of academic curiosity and morbid fascination in me. But I also have enough empathy to understand that this must have inspired unparalleled terror in the village. I know you can protect yourself better than most petty kings, but I still advise caution, old friend. I am sorry. I know I am digressing. Naturally, one should turn to magical explanations next. Some sort of mental shock, perhaps a psychic lance or similar violence of the mind can cause death, and such an attack leaves no trace unless an investigator employs the necromantic arts to resurrect the fallen. Though I know I do not need to tell you about how that would be perceived by Phrasma's church, 
I imagine the only thing more terrifying than a mage hunting villagers at night is another mage resurrecting them afterwards. I know I made a leap there, asserting that a mage is responsible for slaying fishermen with mentalism. In actuality, I do not think this is the case, but I do think you should chase down the possibility in its entirety before reading any further. In fact, you should exhaust every other possible lead, no matter how remote. Uh, death cults, poisoned waters, contagious sudden death syndrome, and so forth, before you continue reading. Yes, I know this must strike you as bizarre, but the following information must be considered a mimetic hazard of the highest order. It is the reason I have had to write around revealing the culprit's identity. Uh, assuming none of those other leads paid off, you checked on them before reading this, yes? It is the same reason the Encyclopaedia Galardianensis prefaces its entry on the entity with a two-page warning. So indulge me, would you, and stop reading now, before you were ready? Continue at your own risk. I believe that the culprit could be a brainchild. This is a very rare, very dangerous, nigh-immortal being conjured into existence by faith alone. A brainchild is sometimes created when a person or group of people believes it exists already, and once one has manifested, the only way to kill it is to convince everyone that it doesn't exist, which can be a monumental challenge once it has begun to kill people. And it will begin without delay for brain children are malevolent and violent. Anger and fear are the powerful emotions that invariably fueled their creation, so they work tirelessly to instill these in others. Physically, brain children can resemble anything. Indeed, I should stress that each is unique, and talking about them as a collective puts great strain on the art of taxonomy. They are entities of illusion, utterly dependent on how others perceive them. That said, they do tend to be seen as quite large specimens, and there is almost always something dreamlike about their appearance. Their features are not fully manifested, or otherwise flick randomly between a dazzling array of appearances. Many survivors report seeing brain children as surrounded by some sort of fog or ethereal substance, which is compliant with what we know about autonomous illusions. Brain children powers are also diverse. If a cult believes that one can summon devils at will, then that becomes a possibility for it. If a group of foresters become convinced that the legend of the woodchopper is stalking them, complete with axes for hands and the ability to bend woodland creatures to its will, then it will be so. And if Mr. Waldry Quentz of Laverton has convinced everyone of the wrath of the Fish King called down on them for disrespecting marine life, then you would expect this phantom to be appropriately sympathetic to aquatic environments. But you must beware. Do not take my speculation as gospel, or you will make it real. If you expect a brainchild to be capable of something, then you will render it true. It only takes one person to believe sincerely in a power to accomplish this. Thus, it is imperative that you quell all rumours at once to leave it with only its basic masteries. Regardless of the beliefs that sustain them, all brain children do possess an innate understanding of illusion magics. They can conjure sounds and sights at will, physically harmless but nevertheless quite complementary to their repertoires. Moreover, brain children can also teleport themselves short distances and create temporary duplicates of themselves to harass and wound their victims. Also, because technically they only exist in the minds of others, they always appear to communicate in an observer's native language. Luckily, belief is a double-edged sword. They are defined by their weaknesses just as much as by their strengths, and urban legends have a tendency to ascribe at least one fatal flaw to their characters. The otherwise invincible knight that can be slain instantly with a cut behind the knee, or the ravenous beast whose flesh dissolves in water like ours does in acid, and so on and so on. Therefore, 
Fighting a brainchild is unlike fighting any other creature, because it is best done off the battlefield. You must engage in what military strategists have called psychological warfare to best one. In other words, you must control the narrative of what it is that is hunting fishermen, and persuade the believers of some convenient weakness. There are tricks to doing this effectively. Do not simply declare that there is no creature, or that the creature is harmless. Although in theory this could kill or mute the thing instantly if everyone believed you, the cat is very much out of the bag now. The deaths are an anchor in the real world, they prove that the illusion is real to others, so to break it you need really to kill the illusion using a method agreed upon by all parties. If a single person thinks the beast is still alive, then it will reform by the end of the week. If that happens, then you run the risk of persuading everyone else that the creature is unkillable, and then I'm afraid the only option is to contain the hysteria. So, my friend, I suggest you proceed with the utmost caution. Brain children cannot be perceived by the ignorant or the mindless, but now that you know, you are vulnerable. Yet it is now vulnerable to you too, for you can go forth and equip yourself with whatever propaganda works best and persuade the others that you have found some ancient text, or heard some prophecy, or discovered some tablet that details with remarkable clarity the Fish King's weakness. Lavatan will never be free of this curse otherwise. Once you have banished the brainchild back to the dimension of dreams and thought, I suggest you sit Mr. Quentz down and explain the situation with all the rugged charm you can muster. It seems he is the source of all this, and unless he changes his thinking, another one may just spawn. I wish you the best of luck in defending the good folk of Laverton from their Fish King, and I hope we meet again soon. I am heading to High Helm at the moment, albeit via quite a scenic route. Maybe I will see you there. Take care of yourself, old friend, and try not to get yourself killed. Until we meet again the guide.